All right. Well, it's six o'clock and we know uh, this is close to the holiday. So we're going to just go ahead and get this get this moving tonight. I'm Tracy Irby. I'm the director at the Center for Women Entrepreneurs. For any of you that are new tonight, uh, the Center for Women Entrepreneurs was funded by the state legislature to promote women entrepreneurs anywhere in the state of Texas. You don't have to be part of the TWU um, university system. We're part of the larger Jane Nelson Institute for Women's Leadership at Texas Women's University. They're dedicated to preparing more women to take on successful roles in business and public service. The three specialized centers, our center, the Center for Student Leadership, and the Center for Women in Government, ensure women have the education to establish careers as successful executives, skills for building entrepreneurial businesses, and the framework needed to run for public office. So thank you all of you uh, being here tonight. Donna Lisa, do we have anyone on tonight who is not of our grant winners who has not been able to introduce themselves? Um, I am not 100% sure. I know Erin um, England has not had a chance and I don't see her on here, but I believe we've gotten everybody else that's that's been available, so. Okay, great. Well, we also have, um, just so everyone knows, this is Donna Lisa Stinyard. She's our associate director. We have Christina Mortel on. I know I saw her. She is our small business advisor. Some of you may be spending time with her. <laughs> and then we have Barbara Renke. She is our program coordinator, and she's also uh, watching Facebook. So welcome, and I will go ahead and introduce our speaker. So tonight, we are lucky to have Rebecca Smith with us. Rebecca is a retired U U.S. Army and a service-connected disabled veteran who understands the meaning, meaning of service and sacrifice. In keeping with her values of integrity and service, she started her own firm to assist business owners and individuals with their legal needs. When not in the office, she volunteers with San Antonio Legal Services Association, SALSA, uh, St. Mary's Legal Clinics, and the Veterans Legal Cl Clinic providing pro bono legal services to the un underserved and veterans in our community. Rebecca uses her talents, experience, and expertise to benefit the community and those in need. Also, she said that she will Okay, and that is uh, <laughs> Rebecca. So Rebecca, we're gonna turn that over to you. Great, I'm going to share my slide here, my screen. Perfect. So there we go. Now we're cooking. All right, make it big. There we are. All right, well, ladies, it is certainly a pleasure to be with you um, tonight. And I appreciate your time and attention. Um, like Donna Lisa was uh, introducing me, or I'm sorry, Tracy was introducing me. Um, I um, am an attorney. I haven't always been an attorney. I was a soldier in the United States Army. And when I was on active duty, I didn't work in the legal field. I actually worked in the medical field. And uh, when I was uh, retired from the military, I was medically retired because I had a spinal cord injury. Um, I went to work for some big corporations like LabCorp and Quest Diagnostics. And when I had my midlife crisis, instead of buying a Corvette, I went to evening law school at St. Mary's University in San Antonio, Texas, always knowing I wanted to open up my own law firm. So after I graduated, I took the bar. I went to work for a local law firm because when you're in school, they kind of teach you the theory of law. They don't really teach you how to practice law. And once I had my sea legs, I did start my own firm. So I have the Rebecca Smith Law Firm. Um, I started it back in 2017. Um, my office is located in San Antonio, but I have clients all over the great state of Texas and beyond uh, because we do a lot of our services virtually and online. If you're like me, 10 minutes after this presentation ends, you're going to think of the question you wanted to ask. Or you may have a question that's very specific and very particular, and you don't necessarily 
want to put it in a chat box for the world to see. And as I go through the presentation, I'm going to be giving you guys a lot of information very quickly. Um, if you think of questions, type them into the chat box. At the end of the presentation, um, there'll be a, a, another minute or so to, if you have any last minute questions, but they'll collate all of those questions and send them to me via email. So that way you'll have all the answers in writing. And also it helps to make sure that you get the most information and the best use of our time. Um, but like I said, if it's a very specific question or um, it has a lot of very personal information and you don't want to put it in a chat box, I do offer an initial consultation, 30 minutes at no cost. Um, you can uh, schedule online on my website. There's a contact us page. Or you're welcome to call my law office and, uh, you know, I have my assistant, Peggy, who uh, can help schedule you and find a time convenient for us to speak. So you can never talk to a lawyer without getting a bunch of legalese. Here's your legalese. The purpose of today's discussion is not to provide you with specific, nuanced, individual legal advice, but rather to kind of provide you with a 10,000 foot overview of the things you need to think about when deciding what entity selection would be best for you. Um, please do not act or refrain from acting based solely on the information you receive here. Rather, make sure you work with your team, talk to your business advisor, get in touch with the bookkeeper or accountant, uh, talk to your insurance person, competent counsel before making important decisions about your business. And while I am an attorney, I am not your attorney unless and until we conclude a formal legal agreement. And please understand that today's brief presentation essentially condenses about four semesters worth of law school into like a singing telegram. So it's not meant to be specific nuanced advice, but it's important when you own your own business um, that you make informed decisions about your business, right? Here we go. Let's talk about business legal structures. If you go to the Secretary of State website and you look at all the different legal entity structures that are available in the state of Texas, it kind of looks like alphabet soup because there are LLCs and PLLCs and PCs and PAs and JVs and LPs and LLPs. And each one of those particular entities um, are geared towards a specific industry or they may play a role in a complicated business structure. But for the purposes of today's discussion, we are going to discuss four ways that you can run your business, two of which I call the default, because this is America and we love business. And in order to be in business, all you have to do is provide a service or produce a product with the intent to make profit and you're in business. That's all it takes. If you're doing it by yourself, you're a sole proprietor. If you're doing it with someone else, you're in a partnership. And then we're gonna talk about two uh, entity formations that are done at the state level. One of which is the limited liability company, also called LLCs. LLCs made up 86% of the new business formations last year in Texas. So it's not a one size fits all, but it is a big shoe that a lot of feet fit into. And you'll see there's some flexibility with the LLC that um, can be advantageous to a small business owner. Um, and do understand too, LLCs aren't just for little businesses. Google is an LLC, right? So just because you're an LLC doesn't mean you stay small. And then we're gonna talk about corporations because as great as LLCs are, sometimes being a corporation is the thing you need to be. So how do you know? Right? How do you know whether or not you're okay just operating by yourself, right? Or whether or not you need to go through the time and expense of creating an LLC or corporation, an entity. And we even call them an entity, like something out of a science fiction movie, right? Because when you go through the, the time and effort to create that entity on the state level, right, you've created something separate from you. Because when you are operating your business as a sole proprietor or partnership, you are your business. There's no separation between the two. When you create that entity, now we create separation between yourself and the business, right? And your entity, right, can do everything you can do. It can 
sign contracts, hire and fire employees, bribe property, get insurance. It can do everything you can do except for vote, right? So what do you need to think about? Well, here's a series of questions that you need to ask yourself. And I always tell folks, begin with the end in mind. So for example, one of these are employees. So maybe when you first start out, you're not gonna have employees, right? It's just gonna be, you know, the big three, you, yourself, and I starting this business. But as you expand and grow, you may have a plan, and this is where business plans are important, to eventually hire employees. So begin with the end in mind. And if, as you answer these questions, you're like, I'm probably gonna need to be an LLC, it's better to start off as the thing you need to be, right? Rather than try to convert later. So the first one is liability. And when an attorney says liability, what we're really asking is what's the chance you're gonna get sued? And if you do get sued, how bad is it going to be, right? So you can think of it kind of like a risk meter And the higher your risk is, the more you're gonna to wanna to separate yourself from the company, right? Because if you get sued as a sole proprietor, you're getting sued. If the company gets sued, it's just the LLC that gets sued, right? Um, and with that being said, there is no entity structure that takes the place of adequate insurance coverage. You need insurance coverage on your business for the same reason you have insurance coverage on your vehicle, right? So if you're driving down the highway, I-35, and you get into like some bozo changes lanes and runs into you, you don't go out and hire an attorney, right? You have an insurance company, you call up your insurance company, you file a claim. Insurance companies have entire stable fulls of attorneys whose sole purpose in life is to bring and defend lawsuits on behalf of their clients. The same is true in business, right? So what kind of insurance you need depends on what kind of business you're in, right? So I'm a lawyer. And so I have malpractice insurance, just like a doctor or dentist or chiropractor or mental health professional. If you were in the consulting business or real estate or interior design and people rely on your advice, right, to make decisions, then you likely would want errors and emission insurance. It's called ENO. If you have a brick and mortar location where your patrons come in, you're going to want premise liability insurance. So if you're, one of your customers walks in and trips over their own feet and breaks a hip, you're not on the hook for all of their medical bills, right? You have insurance to cover that, right? Same with employees. Um, if you have employees, you're going to want working comp. So depending on what your business is and how you're going to operate your business depends on the risk, if you will. So other things that are risky. If you have anything that flies, floats, or rolls in the general population, right? So if you're going to start a company, um, it's going to be one of those medical transport companies, and you're going to get those big fancy vans with the wheelchair lifts, and you're going to run around, pick people up, take them to the doctor's appointments, right? Your risk has gone all the way over into the red. Why? Accidents happen, right? And the plaintiff attorneys, um, also called trial attorneys, and these are any attorney you see advertising on TV or on the radio. Uh, their faces are all over billboards and the sides of buses. And they even advertise, were you in an accident with a commercial vehicle? Right? When you're the business owner, you're the commercial vehicle owner that they want us to. Right? So if you, if you have anything out there that causes accidents, um, what else? If you... Uh, Maybe, oh, anything to do with children. That's another good example. I, I have, I love kids. Kids are great, right? I had two of my own. They were little darlings. But let's face it, kids do dumb stuff. And if a kid does something dumb and it's on your watch, right, even if it wasn't your fault, you will likely be sued, right? Um, so if you have anything to do with children, you run a martial arts studio, right? And you're going to uh, pick up the little darlings after school and, and provide daycare for them. Um, or after school care, if you run any kind of uh, coding camps or sports camps or anything to do with children, right? Risk goes up. Um, next, employees, right? So if you have employees, not only does your uh, risk of meter go up, but also the reasons why people can sue you go up too. So when you have an employee, you create a special relationship between you and the employees called agency. 
And it's kind of a legal mumbo jumbo term, but essentially it means that you as the employer are responsible for the actions of the employee so long as the employee was on the clock and doing the business of your business. So just kind of like kids, if your employee does something dumb, right, while they are working on the job, it's not the employee who gets sued, you get sued, right? So for example, let's say you're running a restaurant and uh, you get tired of paying the DoorDash and Uber Eat fees that are just really expensive. So you have this young busboy who's like super efficient. He's a nice kid. He shows up every work for work every day on time. And you said, hey, you want to make some extra money? So instead of busting on Friday and Saturdays, why don't you deliver the food for our customers and you can keep like extra money and all the tips, right? Brilliant idea, except um, the busboy gets in an accident while he's delivering the food, right? So now the busboy isn't the one who's going to get sued. If the plaintiff attorneys find out who's delivering the food, you're going to get sued as the employer. And the plaintiff attorneys will likely pull a driving record check on the fellow. And let's say he had some speeding tickets and maybe a DUI and you didn't know about it, right? Now you're going to get hit with an extra cause of action, right? Like negligent entrustment, right? Negligent hiring. You never should have hired someone with a bad driving record to drive on behalf of your company. So you want to make sure that if you have employees, it's going to push you to separate yourself from the business. Um, next, if there's partners involved. So you're going to find out pretty quick that this attorney is not a fan of state law partnerships, right? If you are going to go into business with anyone, and I don't care if it's your mom, your brother, your best friend since kindergarten, right? Do not do so as a state law partnership. And the reason being is something called joint and several liability. And I will give you an example of that in a few minutes. But I do a lot of business formations. I help folks create businesses. I help folks bring on investors. I help folks buy and sell businesses. I also do business divorces, right? And you don't think you know someone and they were best friends forever and they go into business each, with each other. And seven years later, they can't stand to be in the same room with one another, right? And the one who's leaving wants a million dollars and the person who's staying doesn't give them two nickels. So if you are going to go into business with anyone, do so at least as an LLC. Um, next is investors. Where are you going to get the money? Right? Well, um, where you get the money at can sometimes dictate what kind of entity formation you can be. So they have a program called Rollover for Business Startups. So let's say you've worked for corporate America for many, many years, and you have half a million dollars sitting in an IRA or 401k. You can use a portion of that money to start your business. But what you don't want to do is go open up an LLC and go pull out a couple hundred grand, right? Because you're going to get hit with ordinary income tax. And if you're under 59 and a half, a 10% penalty. Right, so it's kind of like taking money out of your retirement account at 47% interest. Instead, you go to a company that specializes in these, and there's a bunch out there. Ask your business advisor. I know there's um, Guidan, Veritran. There's a whole bunch of them out there that do this, and they will start a C corporation. And then after the company set up, the, the other organization will do the rollover from your 401k into your new business. Right? And then there's no taxes and no penalty. And you get to use all of that money to start your business. Right? Um, let's say you have a dynamite business idea. It's like one of those products you see on Shark Tank. And you are going to actively seek venture capital and angel investor money. So my grandmother, God rest her soul, once told me that you can eat breakfast with the devil if you have a very long spoon. And the same is true of seeking funding from these private equity professional investors. And do realize these venture capitalist folks are professional investors and they will want a certain return on their money, generally in a fairly short time frame. And if you fail to perform, they generally have ways of taking over your company and you essentially become an employee for them. So if you are actively seeking these types of investors, 
Um, generally, they prefer to invest in Delaware C corporations. Um, you know, just make sure you have competent counsel helping you uh, and you understand everything you sign when dealing with those folks. Um, next is taxation. So for the purpose of today's workshop, you have to realize that the IRS thinks it's 1923 and not 2023. And in 1923, not very many people had phones. So the IRS is never going to call you up and demand a payment, right? It's always the same. We've been trying to get a hold of you. Uh, you're under criminal indictment. If you don't make a payment now, we're going to come and arrest you. It's bogus. It's a scam. Don't, don't pay them. Also in 1923, there was no such thing as the internet, right? So you'll never get an email from what substantially looks like an irs.gov return address saying basically the same thing. We've been trying to get a hold of you. You're under criminal indictment. We're about to seize everything and arrest you. Click here to pay now. Don't click there. It's a scam. Also in 1923, there was no such thing as a limited liability company. Limited liability companies weren't even thought of till the 1980s. They weren't adopted by all 50 states until this century. So for that reason, there's no such thing as a tax status for an LLC. So if you are a single member limited liability company, right, you'll start your business at the state level as a single member LLC, do all the business of your business as a single member LLC, sign contract, hire and fire employees, you know, buy property, whatever you need to do. But when the time comes for you to file your taxes, right, by default, you will file them on a Schedule C as if you are a sole proprietor. And then for a multi-member LLC, right, same deal, right, you and your friends start a company as a multi-member LLC, do all the business of the business as a multi-member LLC, separation between the owners and the business activities, but when the time comes to file your taxes, you will file their your taxes by default on a partnership tax return. But limited liability companies have an option to be taxed differently. Limited liability companies can be taxed as a corporation. Well, why would you want to do that? Because it can save you a bunch of money. Understand that when you are in business for yourself, you will feel like the tax man has his hand in your front pocket all the time. And how much he gets and when he gets it is all about tax management. So you can defer your taxes, you can delay your taxes, you can manage your taxes, the taxes you will pay. And I don't know if they said in my bio, I'm also a tax attorney, so that's helpful. Um, next, uh, oh, for taxation, corporations can be taxed one of two ways, either a C corporation or an S corporation. We'll go over those definitions in a bit. Next is succession or franchise planning. And when I say succession, it's kind of like that HBO show, but not quite so dramatic. Um, when you are going to start your own business, you have to have a passion for it. You have to have a fire in your belly to get you up every day to do the hard work that needs to be done to make your business successful. But what happens in 15 years from now or 20 years from now when you're in a very different place in your life? Right? What happens to your business when you don't want to do your business anymore? Well, if you're operating as a sole proprietor, you are your business. There's no separation between the two. So the only thing you can sell are the assets of the company. If you have created an LLC or a corporation, you can sell the entire entity, right? Because now you, you have something separate from you. So you can sell all the membership shares of the LLC. Right? Or you can sell all the shares of the corporation. Right? And for franchising, um, franchising can be very lucrative. Um, basically, you create a business in a box. Um, but it is something that is governed by the Federal Trade Commission, the Security and Exchange Commission. You have to be an entity to franchise. Right? You can't franchise a sole prop. And finally, who's your customer? So if your product or service is geared towards other businesses, like a B2B type situation, businesses prefer to do business with other businesses. Because if a business is doing you know, business with you as a sole proprietor, it's as if they're doing business with you as an individual. And then if your customer is going to be eventually government contracting, so let's say you want to get your entity up and standing, you want to get your certifications in line, you want to build your capacity, and then you want to start bidding on government contracts. 
And when I say government contracts, everybody thinks about the Fed. And don't get me wrong, federal government has a lot. Right? There are a lot of government contracts out there on all different levels. But the state also has contracts, right? And the county, and the cities, and even universities, right? So if you want to get into contracting, right, and that's what you want to do, you're going to need to be an LLC because if they give you a government contract as a sole proprietor, it's as if they're giving you that contract, right? And there are sort of a very few isolated incidences that that happens, but the vast majority of government contracting is done as an entity. So always begin with the end in mind. And if you're like, oh yeah, I need to be an LLC or a corp, be what you need to be before you get going. So I like to tell stories because that's how people remember things. <laughs> we, are, we are a band of storytellers. So I make biscuits. I make the best biscuits you've ever had. I make the kind of biscuits that every time there's a get together at the church or girls game night or any kind of potluck or pitch-in, they're like, hey, Becca, can you bring your biscuits? Those things sure are good. And one day a very good friend of mine called me up and she said, hey, Becca, I got to throw a bridal shower for my future daughter-in-law. Can I buy six dozen of your biscuits? I'm more than happy to pay you. Now, I like to bake biscuits and I like money. So I said, sure. Am I in business? I produced a product with the intent to make profit. I'm in business. Right? That's all it takes. So next thing I know, after her little soiree, I, my phone is ringing off the hook. Everybody who tried those biscuits that party want to buy some Becca's biscuits. So I'm here in San Antonio, and there's a little place downtown called Maestro where you can rent commercial kitchen space by the hour. So I go rent some commercial kitchen space. I've, I've got a couple of friends in the neighborhood I knew who were looking for some part-time work, hired them in. I am in the biscuit bacon business, went down to the kitchen supply shop, got some of those giant baking pans. And a friend of mine said, at the very least, you should file an assumed name. So I'm here in San Antonio, so I would go to Bear County. And I filed an assumed name, Rebecca Smith, doing business as Becca's Biscuits. Right? If you were uh, up in Austin, you'd go to Travis County, wherever the county is that you're principally doing business, that's where you file your assumed name. Always recommend getting an EIN so that way you can protect yourself against identity theft. Right? But understand, I can do all of these things, right? I even went out and bought a used van and put one of those fancy wraps on it, said Becca's Biscuits on the side to deliver, right? I can, I can lease space, I can hire employees, I can um, sign contracts, I can get a van. I can do all these things as a sole proprietor. But understand, there's no separation between me and my business. Rebecca Smith is Becca's Biscuit. And one of the big questions I always get is, well, how do you pay yourself from the business? Well, when you're operating as a sole proprietor, your salary is essentially profits of the business. And if the business is doing well, you're making money. If the business is not doing well, you're not making any money. So we talked a little bit about the same names. If you're a sole proprietor or a partnership, you would go to the county office. They're good for 10 years. As you come up close to that 10-year mark, you can always renew it. Um, if you have a company, though, if you're an LLC, a limited liability partnership, corporation, any kind of entity registered at the state level, you only register with the Secretary of State. If you meet some old school person who's like, no, no, you have to register at both, that used to be true, but the law changed, I believe, in 2019. And now if you are an, uh, any kind of entity at the state level, you only file with the state. Once again, it's good for 10 years. If you're still using the assumed name, then you just renew it, right, before it expires. We talked a little bit about the EIN. You use this instead of your personal social security number. Super easy to obtain. You go online. There's an irs.gov website. Use it for banking and paying taxes. For some, for some reason, you wind up on a website that you put in all this very personal information and they try to charge you $200, you're on the wrong website. Right? There's a lot of lookalikes out there because the irs.gov EIN costs you nothing. Right? And do be aware when you start your business, there's a lot of predatory companies out there that prey on young entrepreneurs who don't know any better. 
right? So lookalike websites to charge you $200 for an EIN you can get for free, right? Or they offer these certifications that cost hundreds, if not thousands of dollars that should cost you nothing to get, right? Or uh, better yet, you'll get these things in the mail if you start any entity at the state level that's like, get your labor posters. You have to have these or you're going to be a violation of, you know, federal code, blah, blah, blah. And they look scary as hell. And it is hard to see where it says this is an advertisement, right? It's very deceptive, right? When in doubt, reach out. You can always reach out to me. You can reach out to your business advisor, somebody and say, I got this thing that says I need a certification for my business. Do I really need to pay them $300? The answer is no, it's a scam, right? And I am quick to point and how when I see the scammers out there, right? You will get my email after this. Like I said, my goal in life is to shine the light. And if I can save a sister from spending money that she doesn't need to, I am more than happy to do that. So everything's going along great in my biscuit bacon business. I am thumping on all eight cylinders and my very best friend in the world, Denise calls me and she says, and I've known Denise for more decades than I care to say out loud. We went to undergraduate together. And she says, you know, Becca, I believe in you. I believe that you can take this biscuit bacon business to the next level. But in order to do so, you're gonna have to have your own dedicated commercial kitchen space, right? No more renting by the hour down at Meister. And she had $30,000 she wanted me to have to start this enterprise, to expand my business. And I said, thank you very much. And I took her money. Are we partners? On the slide is the state law definition, the state of Texas definition of a partnership. Two or more individuals contributing money, labor, and or skill to a business, sharing in its profits, losses, or management. Now, based on that incredibly broad definition, you can imagine there are a lot of accidental partnerships in the state of Texas. Nowhere in here are any of the contract requirements, like a, a meeting of the minds or a signed writing. None of that's in here. You can simply have a misunderstanding between two folks and wind up in a partnership. Now, in this instance, when Denise sent me the money, I said, thank you very much. As soon as I start making some money, I'm going to pay you back. And I meant it as you're loaning me $30,000 and I'm going to pay you back. What she heard was, I'm an individual who contributed money and I'm sharing in the profits. I'm a partner. Who's right? Well, often that winds up in court and being, gets litigated. And in this instance, without talking to me or any discussion, Denise uh, stopped by the bakery and picked up two dozen biscuits. And she went to go see a friend of hers at HEB, HEB Procurement. And she said, oh my goodness, you have to try Becca's biscuits. They are the best ever. And that person tried my biscuits and said, oh my God, these are the slam damnest best biscuits I've ever had in my life and handed my friend Denise a contract, a requirements contract for 600 dozen biscuits a week. Becca's biscuits was going to be in every HEB in Southeast Texas. We were going to be the next Texas Primo pick. Now, when we breached that contract, and we will breach that contract because there is no way we can make that many biscuits that fast. Who is HEB going to sue for damages? Well, they're going to sue both of us. That's the concept of joint and several liability. And that's why this attorney is adamantly opposed to state law partnerships. Because even though Denise had no conversation with me, even though she... God bless her, she has many admirable qualities. She doesn't know nothing about bacon biscuits. There was no discussion about our abilities or quantities or output. I'm as liable for that contract as if I had signed it myself. Because when you are in a state law partnership, you are liable for the actions of other partners so long as it was in furtherance of the partnership. And when the lawsuit comes, you everybody's gonna get sued. Every partner any involved in the business will be sued. And whoever has the money will have to pay the judgment, whether you knew the actions were happening or not. 
So we get the ATB kerfuffle settled, right? We settle out of court. We said, you know what? We really need to be an LLC, right? And let's think about my biscuit baking business for a minute though, right? So let's go back to that first page I spent so much time on. And let's think about these questions in relationship to my biscuit baking business. So I'm producing a product for consumption. And even though I have product liability insurance, right, my risk is going up. Because if I get a bad batch of flour in, it's got that aflatoxin fungus stuff in it, there's no way for me to look at the flour and know that it's no good. And I bake a bunch of biscuits and people get sick, I'm going to get sued, right? I had employees. My risk is going way up, right? I had a van that drove around delivering my biscuits. Based on those criteria alone, I never should have been operating Becca's Biscuits as a sole proprietor. I should have started off as an LLC. And when Denise came to me and said, hey, I got this money, it would not have been any confusion because we would evaluate the business and say, oh, business is worth $300,000. You're going to contribute thirty. That'll give you a 10% ownership in Becca's Biscuit. Right? She never would have gone to ATV. She would have known exactly what her role was in the company, which is a 10% minority owner. She would have had no ability to sign contracts. Right? In the paperwork, it would have just been some paperwork. We just do a membership interest purchase agreement and resign a company agreement. Right? So if you can look at your business and evaluate it on your business plan and be like, okay, I'm going to need to be an LLC or a corporation, start off as the thing you need to be. Right? So now, uh, we decide to file with the state of Texas to create our LLC. Now, I'm a veteran, but my friend Denise is not, right? So we would not qualify for that waiver of fees. But if it's a 100% veteran-owned business, you can apply to get a waiver of fees. You will need a letter from the Texas Veterans Commission, as well as in an additional form to file, save you 300 bucks. Um, so we filed for Becca's Biscuits LLC, paid our $300, and we got rejected. Why? because there's a Becca, a B-E-C-K-H-A biscuits up in Fort Worth. And you cannot have the same or deceptively similar name to any active business in the state of Texas. So the good news is, is the Secretary of State rejects you, they don't keep your money, right? So we got our $300 back, so now we have to refile. So now we filed Becca's Bodacious Biscuits, LLC, and that was accepted. And now we'll file an assumed name only with the Secretary of State. So it's Becca's Bodacious Biscuits, LLC, doing business as Becca's Biscuits. And I would go down to the county courthouse and abandon my other assumed name. Because see, now Rebecca Smith is no longer doing business as Becca's Biscuits, right? Now I'm an LLC. Uh, next thing you need is a company agreement. Company agreements are the contract by which you, and if there is anyone else in the business, uh, agree to operate the company. If you're a single member LLC, it's a very short contract. It's like five, six pages long. Essentially, you agree with yourself to run your business in accordance with all federal, local, and state regulations and uh, keep your books in accordance with Department of Treasury and IRS rules, right? Easy peasy. And I apologize, I have a large dog. Um, if you have um, a multi-member limited liability company, right? Uh, then these contracts become 30, 40, 50, 60 page long contracts, right? And essentially, you need to cover all of the what ifs, right? So, what if someone declares bankruptcy, right? Having an ownership interest in a company is like having a property interest. Um, what happens if someone passes away? What happens to their membership interest? Do the other members have first right of refusal? Uh, what if you have a company like my biscuit baking company, recipes are a trade secret, right? And so as a trade secret, like who owns that secret? Well, it should be the company, right? So we can have a section on there that is about intellectual property. So that way, if Denise brings her grandma Betty's double Dutch brownie recipe to, you know, contribute to the company to increase our pastry offerings, then it belongs to the company, right? It's, her, it's the company's property. It's not my property. It's not her property. Uh, in there, you can also include non-competes, right? Like, and also buy-sell agreements. Like, what happens if someone gets mad and wants to leave the company? Well, that's fine. You can leave, 
right? We'll pay you. We'll even put in a fair value clause. Like this is how we'll value your membership. We can agree, right? We can look at book value and we'll hire a business appraiser, right? We can decide ahead of time how we're going to resolve these things. Right. And if you want to leave, we'll even set out payment terms like 10 percent down and equal monthly installments for three years or whatever works. Right. All of these things can be decided ahead of time while everybody's still friends. Right. And before the money comes in, because you think, you know, somebody and then the money starts rolling in and people get squirrely. Right. And you can even include other types of provisions. So if it's you and someone else and you both work in that business, right, equally contributing. Well, what happens if someone gets into a terrible car accident and becomes disabled and now can no longer work in the business, right? Like you can write in a disability clause. Like, you know, you got six months to recover and then after that, we're gonna force the sale of your membership because it's not fair to the other person to pull both loads while the other person is recovering. And likely they would have to hire someone to do their job. And let's face it, when you work in your own company, one person never replaces you. They usually have to hire three or four people to replace the one owner, right? Because you you will never work as hard for yourself as you ever did for anyone else, right? You'll work twice as hard for yourself, right? All of these things can be set out in a contract signed. Cannot stress enough the importance of, a, of adequate company agreement. Next is a registered agent. There's a lot of confusion about what a registered agent is. Um, all a registered agent is, is the, the person or the business who agrees to sign for service. What does that mean? That means if you get a lawsuit against you, right, who's going to sign for the lawsuit? Well, your registered agent does if you're an entity at the state level. Um, understand that the registered agent needs to consent, right? So if you get one of those virtual mailboxes at those UPS stores, the minimum wage kid behind the counter is not going to consent to sign when the process server comes with a lawsuit, right? So you need to have consent. Um, there's lots of companies out there that do registered agent service. I have one that's a woman-owned, veteran-owned business called Texan Agent. It's 50 bucks a year, not expensive, right? There are all sorts of them out there. Um, but you need to have one for your business. You can be your own registered agent. Right? So if you have a brick and mortar location and you want to be your own registered agent, that's fine. If you have a, a home-based business and you have some privacy concerns, then get a P.O. box for your principal place of business and hire a registered agent service. Because anything you put on that certificate of formation is readily available public information. Right? Next, it needs to have its own EIN. So I had been operating Becca's Biscuits, sole proprietor, Rebecca Smith. I had a bank account, had an EIN, was paying payroll, had employees, doing my taxes, the whole nine yards. Now I have ba Becca's Bodacious Biscuits LLC doing business as Becca's Biscuits. It has to have a new EIN. I cannot port the EIN from my sole prop over into my LLC. So now think about all the things that's associated with your EIN. Now I'm going to need a new sales tax certificate because biscuits are a prepared food. I had to collect sales tax. Now I'm going to need to re-sign all my contracts, right? Now it's not Rebecca Smith signing, it's Rebecca Smith, manager of Becca's Bodacious Biscuit. Now I'm gonna to need to retitle that car. Now I'm gonna to need to set up with both the state and the federal that Becca's Bodacious Biscuits is now the what we call a successor to the other company, right? At the, the state level, as well as the federal level for the payroll taxes and all that good stuff, right? So. If you know what you need to be, start off those things that you need to be, right? <laughs> Begin with the end in mind, and you can avoid a lot of this administrative transition pain. So Texas is also a very easy state to do business in. Many states charge a fee every year for having a company active in the state. Texas does not. Texas requires that you file two forms every year if you have an entity at the state level. There's no cost to file these forms, right? You do them online, takes you 15 minutes. You don't need to have done your taxes. You just need to know the gross revenue for your business for the previous year. It's due by May 15th, right? One is called a franchise tax form. It's kind of misnamed. It should be called a business tax form, but this is Texas and we don't use like using business and tax in the same sentence. 
but you don't have to be a franchise to have to follow this form. You just need to have an entity at the state level. And then the next is a public information report. They're easy to do. You do them through the comptroller web file, it takes you 15 minutes. You can do them at midnight in your pajamas and 15 minutes will save you $50 because if you miss the May 15th deadline, there's a $50 late fee. If you um, completely like mess up and completely forget about doing it, then they will eventually forfeit your entity and your right to do business in the state of Texas. And then it's going to cost you more money to get your entity back in good standing. Um, and let's say you started your LLC, you planned on getting it going, but like life happened, the, you know, the money fell through, the kids got sick, the dog died, the husband got super needy, whatever, and you had zero gross revenues, you still need to file that franchise form, right? Good news is, is you will not owe tax if your business grows, unless your business grows more than $1.23 million, right? We should all be so blessed as to owe franchise tax someday. So it's important that you understand that the, the business is, they call it a hybrid. Um, you do not have to have annual meetings with an LLC, but you do need to have meetings and document when you do important things with your business. So even if you're a single member LLC, you need to have a meeting with yourself and after much thought and consideration, determine that it's in the best interest of the company to do X, Y, and Z. And then now, therefore, resolve, we're going to do these things. And then empower yourself to sign a document, right? And then you sign it, member of whatever LLC you are. Um, if you're a multi-member LLC, it's even more important to make sure we have membership agreement on things. Um, understand that there's no, it's called pass-through taxation. That's fancy lawyer speak for all of the profits and all of the losses passed to the owners of the company, right? The entity itself does not pay tax. The people who own it pay tax. And you have that opportunity to choose to be taxed differently, right? You can choose to be taxed as a corporation. Very easy to do. It's just some paperwork you fill out with the IRS and send it in, right? IRS waves their magic IRS once as poof, now you're an S Corp. Now, instead of a, a 1065 or a Schedule C, now they're going to be looking for an 1120S from me. right? You have 75 days from the date your entity has started to choose an S Corp election or every January 1st to March 15th, you can make that S-Corp election. So if you're just getting your business up and running in the first year, maybe you make like 30 grand net profit. Next year, you make 50 grand net profit. And you can tell that that next year is going to be the year that you're going to you know, make more than 100K. That's when you drop your paperwork to be taxed as an S-Corp. And I'll show you why in a few slides. I cannot stress enough, you must keep the entity separate. Right. If you are going to form an LLC or a corporation, anything at the state level, I tell folks, treat your business like your favorite second cousin. Right. And you would never expect your favorite second cousin to pay your personal bills. Well, don't write, don't pay your personal bills out of the business checking account. Right. All of the revenues go into the business bank account. All of the expenses come out of the business bank account. You have a credit card associated with the business, only business expenses. Failure to do so is called commingling funds. It's just as dirty as it sounds, right? Commingling funds means that you are mixing your business with your personal. And you need to keep all the transactions at arm's length, right? So let's say your business is having some cash flow issues and you need to loan your company 20 grand and you would just rather loan it yourself to the business to be paid back at a later date instead of going to a bank because interest rates are ridiculous and your fees are even more ridiculous. You can do that, but just like you wouldn't hand your favorite second cousin 20 grand with an IOU promise, no, you would expect a promissory note, right? With repayment terms and interest, right? That's an arm's length transaction. Failure to do so, right? You know, and, and no one ever expects the loss, right? We're all bumping along, just, you know, doing our thing, making money, making our business successful, and then boom, you get hit with a lawsuit. Right. If you've been running loosey goosey with your company and those plaintiff attorneys think that they can establish what they call alter ego theory, meaning you didn't treat your company like a company, you treated your company like a giant piggy bank. Right. They will attempt to establish before the court or get a jury charge stating alter ego theory. And they will request that the jury strip your entity of its status and reach through. It's called piercing the corporate veil so that they can get to you personally, 
So if you're going to go through the time and expense of creating a company, treat your business like a business, right? And that way you can avoid this alter ego theory. So if LLCs are so great, who needs corporations? Well, corporations have built-in power structures, right? You got to have a board of directors. You have to have officers. You have to have shareholders. Good news is this is Texas and one person can do all of those roles, right? But let's say you're going to start an oil field servicing company with you and 12 of your family members. Might want to be a corporation, right? Because now we have to find power roles. And that way, if you really need Aunt Mary to be the secretary and treasurer of your company, right? Because she has 30 years of administrative executive experience, but she won't be a part of the company unless you give lazy cousin Larry a role. Well, you can issue him some stock because corporations can issue 10 million shares of stock or more when they are created. LLCs only have 100% membership interest, right? So you can get a lot more pieces of the pie for folks to go around. Also, you can create, if you have a C-Corp, multiple classes of stock. You can have founder stock, preferred stock, common stock. That's how Mark Zuckerberg keeps control of Facebook. He has founder stock, has disproportionate voting power, and disproportionate dividends. Uh, I put the cons as the time and cost of incorporation. It's the same, 300 bucks, um, also waivable if it's 100% veteran owned, but there's a lot more paperwork. You got to have bylaws. Usually we're doing shareholder agreements. We're doing vesting schedules. Um, there's just more paperwork. And basically more paperwork means more lawyer time. More lawyer time means higher fees. And do be aware that if you are taxed as a C corporation, then you will be subject to that 21% corporate tax on your profit. Called, they call it double taxation, um, but yeah, that's there. Uh, the C corporations are taxed as a corporation, that's that double taxation, but they can retain earnings. All the other entities are passed through, right? Even the S corp, passed through taxation, not a C corp. C corps can retain earnings. Um, they have a lot of flexibility. Anything you see on a stock exchange or in a mutual fund or brokerage account, always a C corp, right? S corporations are the darling of the business world, but they have a lot of rules, right? Um, they do have that pass-through taxation, so no taxation to the entity, but they're limited, only 100 shareholders, right? No more, uh, no only one class of stock. So when you see founder stock, preferred stock, always a C corp, never an S. All of the shareholders must be US citizens or legal permanent residents. So if you want to start an LLC with the best friend that you met in the Peace Corps, who's a Belgian citizen, that's fine. You can't choose an S corp election. And finally, cannot be owned by corporations, LLCs, partnerships, various. I call this the real life human being test. In order to be in an S corporation, you have to be a real life human being, right? So if you're courting that venture capital money, they will never invest in an S corp because they themselves are entities, right? They're limited partnership LLCs or corporations. So how does being taxed as an S-Corp save you money? So let's say my biscuit baking enterprise uh, made 220 grand in a year. I mean, I baked a lot of biscuits and my expenses were 120K. I net profited 100,000 bucks. That's a lot of money for baking some biscuits, right? Happy, happy girl. But if I'm taxed on a sole proprietor, I have to pay self-employment tax, right? 15.3%. So I think we all remember the first time we got a paycheck and we're like, who's FICA and why are they taking all this money out of my check? When you are self-employed, you are responsible for both halves because what you see taken out on your W-2 check is only half of what was sent into the federal government. When you're self-employed, you are responsible for both halves of the payroll tax. And I'm a single lady, so I got to pay single lady tax. So my taxes are like 17 grand on my 100K. Your mileage will vary depending on your marital status, household income, and how many little tax deductions you've still got running around. All of mine have left my house. So at the end of the day, I kept like 67 grand, right? I am pulling full freight on my taxes here. If, however, I was taxed as an S corporation, right, I set myself a reasonable salary. What's a reasonable salary? Not necessarily what you would pay someone to do the job, but whatever passes the IRS SNF test. There's a, a lot of uh, schedules out there if you need help figuring that out. In this instance, I set my reasonable salary at $50,000. That's 25 bucks an hour. I'm a bakery manager. That seemed fair. 
But remember how I said it was passed through taxation? So now I'm still going to need to pay tax on the dividend, right? So my federal income tax didn't change because my dividend is taxed as a short-term capital gain. What has changed is how much money I'm paying in employment taxes. So now only my $50,000 is subject to employment taxes, right? And at the end of the day, I kept almost 75 grand. So in this instance, I saved you over $7,500 in taxes in one year. And that's how choosing to be taxed as an S corporation can help you out. So remember, easy to do, hard to undo, right? And if your entity isn't regularly generating enough income to support your salary, right, then don't choose an escort collection because they're very hard to revoke. You can revoke them. If you do a revocation, they generally won't let you choose a different tax election for five years. I did, I'm running out of time. I did want to touch on the Corporate Transparency Act. This is something new that's starting January 1. So if you create your entity on or after January 1st of 2024, you will have 30 days to register with the Federal Crimes Network. It is called FinCEN, Federal Crimes Enforcement Network. They're part of the Department of Treasury. This is part of an anti-laundering act, right? What is it going to look like? Well, we know there's going to be a fee. We know you're going to have to post information. Um, there's a website there you can click to understand there's a lot of different disinformation. If you are an established entity, you have the entirety of the year of 2024 to register. But every entity registered at the state level in all 50 states and their territories will need to comply with this. And we have just a few minutes, actually we're running a little over time. If you have any last minute questions you would like to put in the chat box, please do so. The good folks there at the Texas Women's Center will compile them and send them out by email to all of the folks so everybody gets the answers. And um, I appreciate your time. Thank you so very much for having me here. It has certainly been a pleasure to speak with you all. Thank you. That was a lot of information in that period of time. <laughs> like drinking from a fire hose, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, then everyone's going to get the the um, question. So we're going to send you that, and then that those questions will be answered and sent out to everybody. Absolutely. Yes, I've grabbed all the questions. So if you've got any more, this is you know going once, going twice, gone. Got it. I just had a vision of someone frantically trying to type it in. <laughs> I think one just made it. <laughs> and then, of course, you can always reach out to my law firm. I do offer that initial consultation, no charge. I'm happy to speak with any of the participants and answer any of the questions they might have. Okay. So, um, Maria, if you have questions, put them in the chat. I'm grabbing them. Those will be sent to Rebecca. She will answer them um, via email and send me the responses back, and then I will send them out to everybody. Okay, because there were quite, yeah, there were quite a few. And again, if some were specific, you will get uh, Rebecca's information from Donna Lisa. Everybody will receive that. Yes. Okay. And just FYI, really quick. Sorry, Tracy. Um, uh -huh. I will, I'm going to copy and paste these questions to Rebecca immediately after this, but we were out of office tomorrow for the holiday. So all of this will come Monday on Monday. That's what. So. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me and I wish everyone much success in their businesses. Right. Thank you so much. Um, I do know we have Aaron. Are you still here? Yes, Aaron England. Yes, you are. Okay. Yes. I think you're the only one who has not been able to introduce your company. So if you want to tell everybody a little bit about you, uh, you and your business, that would be great. Yes, for sure. Thank you. Sorry about that. I missed y'all last time here. Let me see. It's a no makeup day, but I do have a diaper concierge shirt on. Can you see me? 
Yes. I can't hear you now. You were just muted. How's that? There, you're back. Okay, and you're getting a tour of my office. Okay, hi, Erin England. I'm based in Dallas, and I founded Diaper Concierge, and it essentially is diaper vending machines in public places. So we have vending machines are mounted on the wall. They're super cool. They're sleek. They're, they look and function like your iPad. You might have seen them, hopefully. That's the greatest compliment. Right now, we're at um, DFW International Airport in Terminal A and soon to be Terminal C and D by the end of the year. Really excited about that expansion. And then we're in Dallas Love Field, um, you know, the regional airport here. We have four machines there. We're at SMU Football Stadium. We're going to Comerica Center. We're going in Kidzania. We're trying to get in all these high traffic, family friendly places. And I and think that's it. I, I found it in 2019, but we hung our first uh, machines in 2021. So I'm just over two years of a uh, uh, in revenue, which is a great place to be. No more conceptual. Yay. Well, we're, we're happy for that. And, um, uh, our grant was going to help with those, right? The, yes, it purchased, uh, almost one machine. It, yeah. <laughs> it's very helpful. I bought, I bought four right. more. Yeah. Great. Well, Liz said she saw one over the weekend. So. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> be, be sure and buy something. Go buy something. <laughs> there's diapers and there's wipes and there's hand sanitizer. The wet wipes are our biggest seller. Funny enough, uh, people use them for everything while they're on the go. So not just not just babies. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So um, Aaron had also been in our Accelerate Her program, and I think I found it interesting. Did you, what was it? Was you do more sales in men's room or there was something about the men's room that we wouldn't? Yes. Yeah, That's fun nice. fact, the the men's room at Love Field is our highest selling unit. So we have about to have 11 machines and that one for whatever reason. And this group of women will love and hate this. When I first went into Love Field, we were having the initial conversations. I said, okay, I've got four. I'd like to do some in the men's room, some in the women's restroom. And they looked at me like I had two heads. Like why in the men's restroom? Why would you? Oh, so frustrating. So we ended up with one. And the men's and then three in the women's. And wouldn't you know it, the men's is our best seller. Think you never know. We can't assume yeah. anything. <laughs> yeah. 2023 and they don't understand. Anyway, we'll we'll teach them. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Thank you all. This has been great. All right. Donna Lisa, have you got what does anyone just have any general grant questions? So we we are um, getting your supplier numbers and it is going to the next process. We don't know when payment is coming out yet. Again, this happened right as they were transitioning to uh, a new technology financial system. So um, hopefully um, on our next meeting, we'll know exactly or have a better idea of when things will be going out. I, I have a quick question, Tracy. Yes. Um, okay. So we, we were to give that list of items that we wanted to purchase you know, we would use. Now, what if over the time, the course of time, we've realized, uh, you know, we, that a few things are not as either a priority or that's as fine. needed. Yeah, that's fine. You can just send okay. a note, you know, instead of this, I want to do that. Or if you're okay. pivoting quite a bit from where, where you were. Um, just, just okay. through submittable say, Hey, I want to do this instead. Okay. And that's fine. And sometimes people find things on sale and then they end up having more money and need to, okay. you know, than yeah. they yeah.